A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindu Newspaper Analysis brought to you by Shankar A's Academy for the date 22nd of July 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. We are going to start our discussion with this front page article. See, this is a very important article. It says that Ms. Draupadi Murmu was elected as the 15th president of India. She was the former governor of Jharkhand. She is the second woman to become president of India after Pratipa Patel. And she is also the first tribal woman to become president of India. And this is about the news article given here. See, since this is a major event in the country, this year probably we can expect some questions based on president and the election procedure of president in the prelims examination. So, in this discussion, we will revise the President's Electoral College. See, as far as the election of President is concerned, two articles are important. First one is Article 54. It deals with the election of President. The article says that President shall be elected by Electoral College consisting of elected members of both the Houses of the Parliament and elected members of State Legislative Assembly. So, who are all participating in the election of President? It includes elected members of Lok Sabha, elected members of Rajya Sabha, elected members of Legislative Assemblies of States and it also includes the elected members of Legislative Assemblies of Union Territories which have Legislative Assembly. Now, you may ask a question. What about the nominated members? No, nominated members do not take part in the election process. This includes nominated members of both the houses of the parliament and nominated members of state legislative assembly and state legislative council. Now earlier I said two articles are important, right? We finished seeing article 54. Now let us see the next article. The next article which is important regarding president election is article 55. See article 55 deals with the manner of presidential election. The article says that the election of president shall take place in accordance with the system of proportional representation by means of single transferable vote. And it also says that the voting of the presidential election shall take place by a secret ballot. And additionally, this article tries to ensure uniformity in the scale of representation among different states. And it also tries to ensure parity in representation between union and the states. So, it ensures uniformity among different states and it also ensures uniformity between union and the states. Now, how is this ensured? See, the oaths of MLAs and MPs are assigned a value and this value is not assigned arbitrarily but through a calculation. Now, let us see how the value of oaths of MLAs and MPs are determined. Firstly, let us take MLA. We all know who is an MLA, right? MLA is the elected representative of State Legislative Assembly. And the value of vote of MLA is obtained by dividing the population of the state by the number of elected representatives in the Legislative Assembly. Here, the population of the state is taken from the 1971 census. So, we will be getting a value after dividing the population by the elected representatives, right? And this value is further divided by 1000. It may be difficult for you to understand now. But after we see an example, it will be easy for you. Now, let us take the population of Tamil Nadu. According to 1971 census, the population of Tamil Nadu was 4 crore 11 lakhs 99,168. And the number of elected representatives in the Tamil Nadu Legislative Assembly is 234. What we are going to do here, we are going to divide the population by the elected representatives. So, when we divide the population by elected representatives, what we get? will get the value of 1,76,064.82. What we have to do here, we have to divide this value further by 1000. When we divide this value by 1000, we are getting 176.064. So, the value of vote of each MLA from Tamil Nadu is 176. See, this calculation is based on actual values. What we are going to do now is, we are going to take an example with the assumption values. Let us take the example of Kerala. Let us say that the population of Kerala is 1 lakh and the elected representatives in the Kerala Legislative Assembly is 10. If we divide this population by the total elected representatives, we are getting the value of 10,000. If we divide this value further by 1,000, we are getting the value 10. So, here the value of vote of each MLA in Kerala is 10. So, this is how you calculate the value of vote of MLAs in states. 
Now coming back, note that the value of vote of MLA from UP is the highest with the value of 208 and the value of vote of MLA from Sikkim is the lowest with the value of 7. You all know why this difference, right? This is because there is variation in the population in different states. If the population is higher, then the value will be higher. If the population is lower, then the value will also be lower. So far, we have seen the calculation for value of vote of MLA. Now, let us see how the value of vote of MP is determined. See, we know that MLA has a particular value for their vote. And this value is multiplied by the number of MLAs in the state. Again, we are going to take the example of Tamil Nadu here. We already know that the value of vote of each MLA in Tamil Nadu is 176. What we have to do? We have to multiply this each value of vote of MLA with the total number of MLAs in Tamil Nadu. We saw that the total number of elected representatives from Tamil Nadu is 234, right? So, 176 into 234 gives you the value of 41,184. And this value is the total value of vote for the entire state. That is, total value of vote for entire Tamil Nadu. Likewise, total value of vote of every state is calculated and added finally. And this value will be 5,49,495. And this value is divided by the total number of elected representatives in the parliament. See, when we say parliament, it includes elected representatives from both the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. We know that elected representatives from Lok Sabha is 543 and elected representatives from Rajya Sabha is 233. So, the total number is 776. If we divide this value by 776, it gives you the value of 708.1. So, the value of vote of each MP is 708. See, it is very simple. You don't have to complicate it. What we are doing here, we are multiplying each value of vote of MLA with the total elected representatives from that particular state and we are calculating like this for every other state. And we are finally arriving at an answer and we are dividing this final answer by the total number of elected representatives from the parliament. And that is 776 because we have 543 elected members in Lok Sabha and 233 elected members in Rajya Sabha. When we divide the final value by the total number of elected representatives from the parliament, we get a value and this is the value of vote of each MPs in the parliament. See, there is an interesting fact here. When each value of vote of MP is multiplied by the number of MPs in the parliament, that is 776, we get the exact same value. And from this, we can conclude that there is uniformity in the representation between states and the union. See, I am explaining you this because already there was a question asked in the year 2018 in the prelims examination regarding the value of votes of MPs and MLAs. So, it is very important that you know how it is calculated and how uniformity is ensured between union and the states. Now, that's all for this article. With these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, for a second discussion, we are going to take this editorial article. This article discusses about Sri Lankan crisis and why India should bail out Sri Lanka from the crisis. See, the author of this editorial also gives us some insights on how Sri Lanka can get back to normalcy. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let's learn about some important points mentioned in the article. But before that, the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. See, whenever we switch on the news channel or whenever we read about Sri Lanka in the newspaper, we hear that people have been struggling with daily power cuts and shortages of basic amenities such as fuel, food and medicines. See, inflation is hitting more than 50%. Many families are surviving on one meal per day. Middle class people are becoming poor. See, Sri Lanka doesn't have enough fuel for essential services like buses, trains and medical vehicles and it does not have enough foreign currency to import more. We all know that schools have been closed and people have been asked to work from home to help conserve the supplies. And this is the current situation in Sri Lanka. Now, here comes the golden question. How did Sri Lanka land here? See, the reason for Sri Lankan crisis was primarily the economic mismanagement by successive governments. See, the government mismanaged the finance that created and sustained a twin deficit. 
the twin deficit problem is an increase in both the fiscal and the current account deficit simultaneously apart from this due to pandemic sri lanka's tourism industry and foreign remittances were severely affected see tourism and remittances were one of the main sources of income for sri lanka when this was affected due to pandemic the credit rating agencies downgraded the sri lankan credit ratings and this in turn affected borrowing from the international capital markets and we all know no investor would be willing to invest or do business in low credit rated country right and because of all of these factors the citizens of the country turned violent and this resulted in the resignation of president rajapaksha and he also escaped to singapore now later ranil vikraman singe was elected as sri lankan president he is known for his friendly relations with foreign countries especially india so this gives india an opportunity to take the lead in the foreign aid game in its neighborhood know that sri lanka is also not getting enough foreign aid this is because due to pandemic 60% of world's poorest countries are also facing debt crisis so more funds from the international organizations cannot be channeled into sri lanka alone other poor countries should be also funded right and also there is a fear of another global recession and this diminishes the enthusiasm of investors but know that despite these factors india was the first responded to sri lanka's desperate calls for foreign aid india really wants to help sri lanka and there is also some political pressure from south india for indian intervention see in the first 6 months of 2022 india helped sri lanka with its aid worth 3.8 billion dollars and this aid was given in the form of loans swaps and grants see this is india's largest bilateral aid program in the recent times now can you think for a while why india is actively helping sri lanka there has got to be some reasons right see it is very simple stabilizing sri lanka's economy will be a major win for india's neighborhood first policy and once the sri lankan economy stabilizes india can deepen its trade and investment linkages with sri lanka this could result in regional integration and prosperity of south asia on the other hand an unstable sri lankan economy could pose security risks to india and why is this it is because it may lead to a flood of refugees coming to india via pak strait see we already have a lot of refugee crisis in india India cannot afford to take another one. So due to all of these reasons India is trying to bail out Sri Lanka from the crisis. So far we saw about India side. Now let us see what is happening in China side. See we already know that China has emerged as a major partner for Sri Lanka especially for infrastructure projects. But many of them are under scrutiny now. See when it comes to helping Sri Lanka China faces a dilemma. Why is this? It is because already Sri Lanka has to pay a huge debt to China. See, even if China wants to reduce the debt burden of Sri Lanka, it may still won't do it. This is because China fears that other distressed countries will also seek debt relief from China. And if China starts to give aid to all of the distressed countries like Sri Lanka, it will lead to a heavy loss of revenue for China, right? So that is why China is in a dilemma in bailing out Sri Lanka from the crisis. So this situation provides an opportunity for India to increase its aid and investment in Sri Lanka. India should also use this opportunity by working closely with other friendly countries such as United States, Japan, European Union and as well as the International Monetary Fund. Now so far we have discussed about the opportunities for India. Now we'll discuss what Sri Lanka should do to overcome the situation. Firstly, the new government must show that it is serious about stabilizing the economy. As per the International Monetary Fund directive, Sri Lanka has to increase taxes and utility prices to raise the revenue and it should also increase the interest rates to control the inflation. At the same time, it has to spend on social welfare expenditures to protect the poor. So these are all the directives of IMF and it should be followed by the new government. Secondly, Sri Lanka has to implement structural reforms. These reforms include opening up the economy to trade and investment, allowing the market forces to determine resource allocation. This means reducing the barriers to trade and investment, cutting the red tape hampering business, and privatizing loss-making state-owned enterprises such as Sri Lankan Airlines and Ceylon Petroleum Corporation. 
So this is the second step. Thirdly, Sri Lanka has to explain to its citizens that following the IMF program or directives and implementing the structural reforms is the only way forward to address the crisis. So it should create awareness about the structural reforms that they are going to do. and the government should build a national consensus on this regard now fourthly sri lanka has to restore the rule of law and enforce strong anti corruption policies this includes asset declarations for all the parliamentarians and a strong anti corruption office supported by united nations and lastly it has to reset the foreign policy towards a more neutral direction This means that it should prevent in the future from taking the pro china stance of the rajapakshas so according to the author if all the above steps so fall out sri lanka have a chance to get back to normalcy within 3 years and india's continuous support to sri lanka is the need of the r because a friend in need is of course a friend indeed so that's all about this editorial given here with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now take a look at this article it mentions that the asian development bank has reduced its growth forecast for india earlier it predicted a growth of 7.5 percentage for the year 2022 to 2023 but now it has reduced this growth forecast to 7.2 percentage and the article also mentions the asian development outlook report by the asian development bank now this is about the article given here in this context we are going to see some facts about the asian development bank and about the report now when was asian development bank established it was established in the year 1966 it was established in manila si manila is the capital of philippines it was established with 31 founding members and know that india is one among the founding members of asian development bank Currently the Asian Development Bank holds 68 members and among these 68 members 49 are from within Asia and Pacific and the remaining 19 members are from outside. So when there is a question in prelims asking you whether the members of Asian Development Bank are only from Asia at that time you must know that the bank has members both from inside and outside of Asia. Now with this basic information let us see the objectives of Asian Development Bank. During the 1960s when it was established the Asian Development Bank focused much of its assistance on food production and rural development in Asia and Pacific region Here let's take a detour and know that while ADB that is the Asian Development Bank has members from all over the world its operation is mainly in Asia and Pacific Now coming back currently the objectives of Asian Development Bank have diversified issues like climate change water security inequality and poverty can be addressed when the international efforts are properly coordinated so the adb it provides its member countries in asia and pacific with financial assistance knowledge and expertise to tackle these problems so through these efforts asian development bank aims to ensure social development reduction of poverty and attainment of sustainable economic development So these are the objectives of Asian Development Bank. Now let us move on to see the organizational structure of Asian Development Bank. See ADB is modeled similarly to the World Bank. It has voting system similar to World Bank where votes are distributed in proportion with members capital subscription. So as of December 2020, Japan and United States each hold largest proportion of shares at 15.571%. And the next one is China which holds 6.429 percentage of shares and then comes India holding 6.317 percentage. Now moving on to the structure, see the highest policy making body of the ADB is the Board of Governors. And this Board of Governors comprises one representative from each member nation. So a total of 68 governors are there. and these board of governors meet formally once a year during the asian development bank's annual meeting see while board of governors is the highest policy making body the board of directors perform the day to day activities see there are 12 board of directors and they are elected by board of governors and this is about the organization and its structure now let us come to the report which is the asian development outlook report See this report is an annual report by Asian Development Bank. 
The report stated that inflation for India will be around 6.7 percentage, and this is due to increasing oil prices. So, what are the consequences of this inflation? It will reduce the consumer's purchasing power, and due to inflation, RBI has increased its policy rates, and this will make the borrowing costly for the business. See, due to high cost of borrowing, investments will come down, and these are all the consequences of inflation. And next the report stated that due to low global demand exports from India will come down and apart from this the report also stated that the increasing price of commodities will give a boost to the mining sector but the higher cost of raw materials will affect the manufacturing sector and that's all about this news article given here with these key takeaway points let us move on to the next article discussion See this news article here it is about India Innovation Index 2022 see the index may be given as 2022 but it is about the year 2021 since it is published in the year 2022 the index is given as India Innovation Index 2022 so in this index Karnataka has begged the first position among the major states category I know that for the past 5 years Karnataka has retained this position. Then in the northeast and hill states category Manipur has taken the first position. Then among the union territories and city state category Chandigarh came first. And this is the essence of the news article given here. Before we see the key findings of the index, let us know a few facts about the India Innovation Index. Firstly, let us see who releases the report. India Innovation Index is released by Niti Aayog and the Institute of Competitiveness. The report is released every year and this is the third edition of the report. See the report was first published in the year 2019. And one more interesting fact is that India Innovation Index is developed in lines with the Global Innovation Index. Here Global Innovation Index is published by World Intellectual Property Organization. Now with this basic information let us see how the index is calculated the index is calculated by assessing seven pillars classified into five enabler pillars and two performance pillars see the enabler pillars ensure the inputs that help in the innovation process and the performance pillars measures the output of the innovation see each pillar here will have a set of indicators and in the latest index a total of 50 indicators are monitored and based on these 50 indicators only the ranks of the states are arrived at i have given here the enabler pillars the performance pillars and the indicators of the index so i think we have covered the basics regarding the indian innovation index now let us come back to the article see earlier we saw that india innovation index is designed in the lines of global innovation index right this is mainly done to improve the india's ranking in the global innovation index See in the year 2021 India ranked 46th position in Global Innovation Index. India currently aims to make it to top 25. So by framing India Innovation Index similar to the Global Innovation Index and boosting competition among the states India's ranking in the GII can be improved. GII here is Global Innovation Index. See currently three things are acting as obstacles for innovation in India. The first one is low gross domestic expenditure on research and development shortly referred as GDERD. Look at this table here. Presently the GDERD for India is only 0.65 percentage. Compare this to Japan's 3.28 percentage and Israel's 4.94 percentage. See India's gross domestic expenditure on research and development is very low. So the latest India Innovation Index suggests that expenditure on research and development as a percentage of GDP should be raised at least to 2 percentage to get good results. The report also says that the countries that spend less on the research and development fail to retain their human capital in the long run. And we know that the ability to innovate is dependent on the quality of human capital, right? So the expenditure on research and development should be increased. See this will also help achieve the goal of 5 trillion dollar economy. So this is the first obstacle. The next one is that India faces a low private sector participation in research and development. Look at this graph here. From this you can understand that for India 56.1 percentage of investment in R&D comes from the government. While in the case of Israel this value is just 1.5 percentage. 
See, in the case of private sector investment in R&D, India has just 36.8 percentage, and for Israel, it is 88.3 percentage. So the index says that the gap between public and private sector investment in research and development must be addressed to improve India's ranking in Global Innovation Index. And finally, the index says that research publication from India is low and it must be addressed. See, this can be understood better by seeing this graph here. See, India is among the lowest when it comes to research publications when compared to other countries. And the report says that this must be addressed. So that's all for this article given here. Now, with these points in mind, let us quickly go through what all we saw today. In the first article discussion, we saw about the presidential election. We saw two important articles here. We saw about Article 54, which states that the president shall be elected by an electoral college consisting of elected members of both the houses of the parliament and elected members of state legislative assembly. So it includes elected members of Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha, elected members of legislative assemblies of states, and elected members of legislative assemblies of union territories which have legislative. to assembly which includes delhi pondicherry and jammu and kashmir and after that we saw about article 55 which deals with the manner of presidential election it says that the election shall take place in accordance with the system of proportional representation by means of single transferable vote by secret ballot and we also saw that the article tries to ensure uniformity in scale of representation among different states and a parity in representation between union and states and after that we moved on to see about the value of vote for the mlas and mps the value of vote of elected representatives of state legislative assembly that is mla is obtained by dividing the population of the state according to 1971 census by number of elected representatives in the legislative assembly and it is further divided by number 1000 We saw the example of value of vote of Tamil Nadu MLAs, and we saw that MLA of UP has the highest value, which is 208, and the MLA of Sikkim has the lowest value, with the value of seven. And after that, we moved on to see about the value of vote of MPs. See, the value of vote of MPs is determined by multiplying the value of vote of each MLA with the total number of MLAs in that legislative assembly. and this is the total value of vote for the entire state like this total value of vote for every state is calculated and finally added and this final value is divided by number of elected representatives in the parliament which includes both lok sabha and rajya sabha and if the total value of vote of all states is divided by the number of elected representatives in both lok sabha and rajya sabha then you will get the value of vote of each mp and with that we ended that discussion and don't forget that ms draupadi murmu is elected as the 15th president of india and she is the second woman president and first tribal woman to be elected as president of india And after this article we moved on to see an editorial which is about the Sri Lankan crisis in the editorial discussion we saw about the conditions that are prevailing in the Sri Lanka and we saw the reasons for the Sri Lankan crisis which includes economic mismanagement by successive governments and this economic mismanagement led to the creation and sustainment of a twin deficit and this twin deficit is nothing but fiscal and current account deficit and this is one of the reasons for the sri lankan crisis and after this we saw that sri lankan tourism industry and foreign remittances were severely affected due to pandemic and since the main source of income for sri lanka is affected the credit rating agencies downgraded the sri lankan credit ratings and this affected borrowing from the international capital markets and this is also one of the reasons for sri lankan crisis and after this we moved on to see the opportunity for india to take lead in the foreign aid game in the neighborhood see despite many negative factors india was the first responder to sri lanka's desperate calls for foreign aid we saw that india helped sri lanka with aid worth of 3.8 billion dollars and we also saw why india helped sri lanka 
One of the reasons is that it is a major win for Indian neighborhood first policy. And apart from this, if Sri Lankan economy stabilizes, India can deepen its trade and investment linkages and this could result in regional integration and prosperity for South Asia. And after that we saw unstable Sri Lankan economy could pose security risks to India. The major security risk is refugees coming to India via Pak Strait. And after this we saw why China is not helping Sri Lanka. See even though China has emerged as a major partner for Sri Lanka especially for infrastructure projects, it is in a dilemma to help Sri Lanka. Why is that? It is because Sri Lanka already has to pay a huge debt to China and if China helps Sri Lanka now, other countries will also expect the same. But it will be a huge loss of revenue for China and that is why China is not helping Sri Lanka. And finally, we ended the editorial discussion by seeing some of the steps to overcome the situation. The government must stabilize the economy. Some of the IMF directives should be followed which includes increase in taxes, utility prices, interest rates to control inflation. And there should be also social welfare expenditures to help the poor. And after that we saw there should be structural reforms which includes opening up of economy to trade and investment, reducing barriers, cutting the red tapism and privatizing loss making state owned enterprises. And awareness should be created among citizens that structural reforms are the need of the hour. And there should be a national consensus on this regard. And after that we saw Sri Lanka has to restore the rule of law and it has to enforce strong anti-corruption policies. This includes asset declaration and a strong anti-corruption office supported by United Nations. And finally, we saw that Sri Lanka has to set a foreign policy which is of more neutral in nature instead of a pro-China stance which it took in the past. And we ended that editorial discussion with these points. And after that, we moved on to see about Asian Development Bank and the Asian Development Outlook Report. We saw some facts about the Asian Development Bank. It was established in the year 1966 in Manila. Manila is the capital of Philippines. We saw that it was established with 31 founding members. India is one of the founding members and now there are 68 members. We saw that the members are from both inside and outside Asia and Pacific region. And after that, we saw about the objectives of Asian Development Bank. Initially, it concentrated more on food production and rural development in the Asia and Pacific region. But now, the objectives have been diversified. It includes issues like climate change, water security, inequality, poverty. So, it means that the bank provides its member countries with financial assistance, knowledge and expertise to tackle these problems. It also aims to ensure social development, poverty elevation sustainable economic development and after that we saw organizational structure of Asian Development Bank it is similar to World Bank where the oaths are directly proportional to the members capital subscription we saw Japan and United States have the largest proportion after that China is there and after that India holds shares of about 6.317 percentage and we saw that the highest policy making body is the board of governors. It comprises of one representative from each member nation. So there are 68 governors and they formally meet once a year during the annual meeting of the bank. And we saw that the board of directors perform day to day activities and there are 12 board of directors. They are elected by board of governors. And finally, we moved on to see about the Asian Development Outlook Report. It says that the inflation for India will be around 6.7 percentage and the consequences of it are it reduces the consumer's purchasing power. It leads to the increase in policy rates by RBI, which in turn will make the borrowing costly for the business and as a result, the investments will come down. And the second point that the report states is that due to the low global demand, exports from India will come down. And finally, it says that the increasing price of commodities will give a boost to the mining sector, but higher cost of raw materials will affect the manufacturing sector. And with these points, we ended the discussion of Asian Development Bank and we moved on to see about the India Innovation Index 2022. We saw about the report. It is released by Niti Aayog and Institute of Competitiveness. It is released every year. It was first published in the year 2019 and this is the third edition. And we saw how the index is calculated. It is calculated by assessing seven pillars. It includes five enabler pillars and two performance pillars. 
Enabler means it measures the inputs that help in the innovation process. Performance, obviously, it measures the outputs of the innovation. And we also saw the indicators involved in the index. And the major thing is that the index is released to improve India's ranking in Global Innovation Index. And after that, we saw the obstacles for innovation in India. We saw three things. The first one is low gross domestic expenditure on research and development. We saw that India is only spending 0.65% of its GDP in the research and development. See, countries that spend less on research and development fail to retain their human capital. So, the report says that expenditure on R&D should be increased and this will also help achieve the goal of $5 trillion economy. And the second obstacle is that India faces a low private sector participation in the research and development. India has low participation when compared to other countries. So the index says that the gap between public and private sector investment in R&D must be addressed to improve India's ranking in Global Innovation Index. And finally, research publication from India is low and it must be addressed. And know that India's ranking in Global Innovation Index is 46. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion. Today we have four prelims question for our discussion. I will solve three of them and as usual one of them is a quiz question for you. Let us take this first question. Consider the following statements regarding the impeachment of President of India. Statement 1. President can be impeached only on the grounds of violation of constitution. The statement is correct. See, according to Article 61, President can be impeached on grounds of violation of constitution. Now, coming to the second statement, for impeachment of President, a resolution with two-third majority of total membership must be passed by both the houses. This statement is also correct for President impeachment. A majority of two-third of total membership of the houses is required. The impeachment resolution must be passed by both the houses. Now, coming to the third statement, when there is a disagreement between the houses regarding President impeachment, there is a provision for joint sitting. This statement is incorrect. There is no provision of joint sitting for disagreement between the houses regarding President impeachment. So, we saw that statement 1 and 2 are correct. So, the correct answer here is option A, 1 and 2 only. Now, coming to the second question. See, this is a previous year prelims question, which was asked in the year 2018. With reference to election of President of India, consider the following statements. Statement 1. The value of vote of each MLA varies from state to state. See, we saw this in the discussion itself, right? While calculating the value of vote of each MLA, we are taking the factor of population of each state. Do all states have equal population? No, right? So, if population varies, the value of vote of each MLA will also vary. So, the statement 1 here is correct. Now, coming to statement 2, the value of vote of MPs of Lok Sabha is more than the value of MPs of Rajya Sabha. See, this statement is incorrect. Why is this? The value of vote of MPs of both the houses are calculated by dividing the total number of votes assigned to MLAs of all states divided by total number of elected members of both the houses of parliament. Here, there is no chance for variation in the value of votes of MPs of both Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. They all have equal value of votes. So, here the second statement is incorrect. So, the correct answer to this question is option A, 1 only. Now, coming to the third question, consider the following pairs of international organizations and its headquarters. First one is Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. It is given that its headquarters is in Shanghai. The second international organization is New Development Bank and it is given that its headquarters is in Beijing. Now, the third one is World Bank and it is given that its headquarters is in New York. Which of the following pairs are correctly matched? See here, in these first two pairs, the headquarters are interchanged. For AIIB, the headquarters is in Beijing. For New Development Bank, it is in Shanghai. But for the World Bank, we all know the headquarters is in Washington, D.C. So, what is the correct answer here? The correct answer here is option D. None of the above. Now, let us take this final question. Consider the following statements regarding the Global Innovation Index. Read the statements carefully. Think about it for a minute and post your answer in the comment section. I have given a mains question for your practice. 
So, interested aspirants write it and post it in the comment section and if you have any queries related to the article that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section and with this we have come to the end. If you find the video useful, like, share and comment and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.